You're listening to the Wheelhouse Baseball Podcast, a podcast that discusses historic games, quirky stats, and obscure players from MLB history. Get out the right bread and the mustard this time, Grandma! It is a grand salami! Here are your hosts, Jim Tucker, Jeremy Ratajak, and Mikey Kubaki Jr. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wheelhouse Baseball Podcast. This is episode number one. I am your host, Jim Tucker, and I'm joined by two of my great friends, Mikey Kubacki Jr. and Jeremy Ratajak. Mikey, how are we doing today? I'm doing awesome, Tuck. How are you? I cannot complain one bit. Awesome. I'm, uh, I'm super excited to get this podcast going. Uh, I was pretty glad when you got a hold of me, and uh, we started kind of getting the wheels turning on this. I'm really excited for where this is going to go. We got big plans coming ahead, though. Uh, we have someone else with us. Jeremy, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And you know what? I'm actually going to quote Jim from eight years ago when I asked him how it was to join my wiffle ball league. And that is, it's a dream come true to be here. <laughs> Can't believe it. I was, uh, I was thrilled to join the Gas House Gorillas of the Griffle Ball League. Check them out on leaguelineup.com slash griffle ball. Uh, but first, we're going to head into who we are, give you a brief rundown. This is episode one, and we are so excited. So we're a podcast that wants to dive into and discuss historic MLB games. We want to pour through the interesting stats, and we want to talk about and uncover obscure players in MLB history. Before we jump into our episode, let's introduce ourselves to the audience, give them a little bit about ourselves, um, and, and hope that they can get a little bit more familiar with us as hosts and, and, and members of the Wheelhouse Baseball Podcast. So, again, I'm Jim Tucker, uh, a 2008 graduate of Calumet High School in the murder capital of the world. Former, former, proud to say, former murder capital of the world. Uh, they're on the come up. Uh, went to Chicago State University and played baseball. And by played, I mean I threw a ball, and I was a really good batting practice pitcher. Um, and now I play wiffle ball. I take it way too seriously, um, and I teach English at, uh, shout out to Couts Middle School and the Couts Mustangs baseball program entering our third year, so shout out to everyone there. My middle schoolers there that will, I can guarantee you will be tuning in. It's going to be electric. Jeremy, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. All right, well, I went to Griffith High School, um, very nearby the, um, the former murder capital of the world, uh, 28 years old from Highland, Indiana now is where I reside. Um, I actually met Jim at Chicago State University where I played baseball with him. So a fun fact, um, my senior year, I actually had the same exact batting average as 2018 Seattle Mariners all-star outfielder Mitch Hanniger. And you know what? Some scouts might say that Hanniger faced slightly better pitching in the Big West Conference than I did at Chicago State in the Great West. But you know what, Jim, Mike? Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Well, and, and the funny thing about that is, yeah, Mitch Hanniger is a big league baseball player, but I'll tell you what he isn't. He's not a co-host on the Wheelhouse Baseball Podcast. Absolutely not. Where exactly. dreams are coming true. Keep exactly. Yep. Uh, Mikey, tell the uh, the listeners uh, a little bit about who you are. Oh, well, I am also an OA grad out of Griffith High School. Um, I actually know Jeremy from Little League. We go back. I uh, remember his uh, older brother, Jimmy, getting us to uh, wrestle around and then yelling at Jeremy for me beating him up because Jeremy was bigger than me, and he didn't like it. It's good times. I was a peacemaker. Big, yeah. boy, big boy. Yeah, lover, not a fighter. I yeah. like it. Um, I, uh, you know, I have a family, and uh, I I have my, my girlfriend, Kristen, longtime girlfriend, almost seven years. Uh, I, uh, I help her raise her kid. He's Spencer. He's 12 years old. I love them both dearly. We have a dog, and I just got a new puppy as well. Uh, so I have a full house, I guess you could say. Um, I'm formerly of uh, the Fan Divided podcast, uh, also part of the OTSN family of uh, networks. Um, appreciate it, OTSN, uh, for bringing us on. We're really excited to help build the brand here. But uh, I, uh, I didn't play baseball past uh, Babe Ruth, but I've always loved baseball. Uh, I actually bowled instead. I got a scholarship to bowl in college. I competed at Calumet College of St. Joseph, a top program in the nation, and I was on ESPN my sophomore year in the national finals. We got shellacked very badly. I, I remember watching that. That was exciting. Yeah. Well, we, not, not you guys getting shellacked, but just the fact yeah. that you're on ESPN. Yeah, national runners up pretty cool. But, yeah, that's a little about me. That's awesome. I don't remember watching it, but I do remember uh, watching ESPN at some point. Yes. I've heard of the network. <laughs> um 
no free ads, but I have heard of the network. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Mark Burley's perfect game. Um, 2009, July 23rd. Okay. The question I have at the beginning, do you remember where you were? For me personally, I was working at Strack and Van Til's, Love and Life, and by loving, I mean hating. I was working in the deli. This is about two weeks before I sliced my finger off in a tragic deli slicer accident. I am a full recovery. I'm a proud survivor of a deli slicer. I made it. Any workman's comp issued for that? Uh, no, because it was my fault. Okay. So it's, it's tough to get workman's comp if you forget to turn the deli slicer off and still continue to move your finger upon the blade from what I hear. Yeah, you're trying um, hard. You know that you can't be faulted for trying hard. Yeah. Well, and you know, looking back nine years later, I made it. I'm doing okay. I have survived. Uh, Mikey, what about you? Um, I was actually doing a lot of yard work that day. We were painting a fence in my backyard, mowing, we wagged in the whole nine yards. And this was back before we had, uh, all these apps on our phone that send us breaking news and you had to sign up via text message for ESPN, you know, breaking news. And they'd send you a text, hey, so-and-so is a no-hitter through the 5th, through the 6th, whatever. Uh, I had come inside, and I believe I just got out of the shower, and I had a couple text messages, including one, as my phone went off, as I came into the room, and it said, you know, Mark Burley, perfect game going in the ninth inning. So I turned my TV on, and it happens to be on the channel that the game is on, and this is an old tube TV, so the sound came first as the... The TV slowly started to light up, and you started to get actual picture. So I didn't actually see the big hit, but I heard Hawk's reaction. Everyone get real quiet, and uh, I turned it on right as uh, something pretty spectacular happened in the ninth inning. So I, I my timing couldn't have been any better, that's for sure. But uh, Jeremy, I believe you were in a inopportune spot for a Sox fan. Yeah, not so, good. No, not good at all. This is actually this is pretty rough. So um, I was actually at the Lincoln Park Zoo. In Chicago with my girlfriend at the time. Not the um, band, Lincoln Park, just no, for no, clarification. Yeah, yeah, uh, with the, yeah Lincoln okay. Park with the animals and with, has no TV and no radio. So, I mean, you think about it. So, um, it's summer of 2009. I'm, I had just turned 19. Where would, where would I normally be as a 19-year-old? I could be at home with a TV. I could be in a car with a radio. I could be at my college campus, TV or radio. Maybe at the gym, see a TV. But no. I'm at a zoo with no connection to the outside world. And this is the pre-smartphone era, uh, era, so my phone didn't have those capabilities that yours did. I think I might had one of those pay-as-you-go phones from Walgreens. So I actually received a text message from one of my, one of my uh, old college teammates saying Bur- Burley had a perfect game headed into the ninth. And so you know what? All I could think about is that this is my all-time favorite pitcher on my favorite team, three outs away from history, and I'm watching a giraffe eat leaves off a tree. <laughs> I mean, did the, the, the giraffe at least uh, perfectly eat the leaves? He uh, he was very efficient. He got a lot of leaves uh, per bite. His well, leaf, leaf per bite ratio was was very well, efficient. That's Burley. You, you like to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, you like Bur- to hear Burley that. Burley was an efficient guy, so that, that's that's timely. When we when we talk about efficient, we're going to set the stage here. We're going to go into a, a rundown of the game and, and talk about some of the things that pop up. Um, we'll set the stage. July 23rd. 2009. It's partly sunny at the ballpark. Now, in your mind, is it old Comiskey? Is it Comiskey? Is it? Do you call it U.S. Cellular still, or do you? Are you? Are you, Jeremy? I'm asking you, the fan. Are you calling it Guaranteed Rate Field at this point? At today, not in 2009. Nobody's calling it Guaranteed Rate Field in 2009. Got it. Yeah. Right now, I'm calling it uh, Guaranteed Rate. I think it's uh, old. I think it was 2016 when they adopted that name, and it was it literally sounded like the worst thing ever. But you know, I remember in 2003 when they adopted U.S. Cellular, and that sounded like the worst thing ever, just from getting away from Comiskey. So you know what, the stuff grows. You know, it, it's fine as, as guaranteed right now. Yeah, you know, uh, you got to make the money. You got to go where the money's at. And I haven't heard of anything U.S. Cellular in years, so it's probably a good move. Also, I haven't heard, really heard of guaranteed rate. Um, not a fan. Not a member. Not a, a customer. I don't know, but um, not for me. So let's set the stage. July 23rd, 2009, there's 28,036 people in attendance for this game. When we look to today, 2018 season has wrapped up for the White Sox. Barely missed the playoffs this year. It was a hot race. They averaged 20,110 fans at the ballpark, which that number to me was high. Uh, looking, I thought the number would be a little bit lower compared to 2009 when, when you know they won the division in, in 2008. So they're only averaging. Eight nine thousand more fans a game than they did 
this year. Now, and when you compare that number, they're blowing out the Miami Marlins at just over 10,000 fans a game. It's kind of crazy. I thought it was going to be lower. I went to a few games this year when the Red Sox were in town. Uh, Hawk Day was wild. Tons of people. The Friday game, not so much. I, uh, I, I made it there for two games, two Yankees games this year, and uh, pretty packed, although lots of pinstripes. Lots yeah. of pinstripes. Yeah, you'll get that. You'll get that. So uh, 18th perfect game in history. Uh, at that point, it was a 263rd no-hitter. Um, and going into the game, so we're going to go and th- each of us are going to wrap up three innings. So I'm going to lead it off here, be the leadoff hitter, and wrap up innings Wrap up innings one, two, and three. So to lead off the game, he's got a lineup. Burley's got to go through a lineup of Upton, Crawford, and Longoria. And at this time, the Rays are hot. High OBP. They got some good dudes. Starts off every hitter in the first inning with the first pitch strike. So he gets right ahead, gets a ground out to the second baseman, ground out to the pitcher, punches out Longoria. Life is good. White Sox in the bottom of the first inning, nothing doing. Punch out, two flyouts to left field. We go into the second inning, and this is when it starts to heat up, in my opinion. Um, He faces Carlos Pena. This is the first full count of the game. So he toes the line really early in the ball game, seven pitch at bat. And he gets to, um, it, it, it was an 0-2 count. So he starts off 0-2, bang, 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 and then gets to a full count. So um, he ends up getting uh, Pena to pop out to the first baseman, punches out Zobris, and then Pat Burrell flies out. But it, it, he got he struck that ball well. So in the first two innings, the first inning, kind of a wash. Ten pitches, eight strikes, cruising. Cool. The second inning is where he really starts to see a little bit of offensive friction, but he gets around it. Yeah, that Burl shot uh, to right, Jermaine Dyack had to go back deep, and he, he caught it one with a foot almost on the warning track. I mean, you, you think about it, a game that is decided by millimeters, uh, micrometers even, uh, I mean, just the bat, just a little more displaced, and that, that ball's a dinger, or even a soft liner that falls before die. And, I mean, it, would, it hung up there just long enough for die to get there. But it, it was definitely a deep shot. Now, we get into the second inning, and this, for the White Sox, is where the stars come out. And this is going to make sense in a second. Paul Canerco hits a single. Sweet. Carlos Quentin draws a walk. We got guys on first and second. Now, Scott Casimir gets going here. Strikes out uh, Beckham. Strikes out Knicks. Ramon Castro comes up, hits a single. We've got bases juiced. And and this is where all of the cosmic stars align. You guessed it. Josh Fields. Josh Fields comes up. 3-1 count. So he gets into his hitter's count. He works a hitter's count. Um, Probably the best ball he's struck in his life. Sends one out of the ballpark. Four RBIs. Josh Fields. He got a fastball and a fastball count, and he wasn't late. Yeah. Um, Not many people uh, could hit that. Generally, apparently Josh Fields, when we look at his uh, career, didn't hit that well. Let's run down. Let's look into Josh Fields a little bit because I don't know where Josh Fields is. I don't know if it's a, a park. I don't know if it's a city. What is or where is a Josh Fields? I'm pretty sure that Josh Fields is the the son of the Mrs. Fields from Mrs. Fields Cookies. He is. That's a, about as much as I know. I can Josh confirm Fields. that he is a son. Yeah. Yeah, can't, someone. Yeah, can or can't confirm. I'm not sure about that. But I actually do remember well, he, Josh Fields. He would he would be the son of Mrs. Fields. If she had one. Well, I, I thought she, well, well, they were married. Well, I thought Mrs. It's Fields still, was actually was a cookie. No. What, yes. Okay. Could be. Uh, could, uh, could, that, really, no, really that is. Cookies. That's okay. confirmed. Mrs. Fields is a cookie. Okay. Unconfirmed. Can't cannot confirm at this time of recording. Is Mrs. Fields the cookie Mrs. Fields the Josh Fields, Mrs. Fields. Oh, I don't okay. know. I'd love that. I would love to spin that narrative because then we're talking about one of two successful careers. Let's look at Josh Fields' statistics. Jeremy, what do you have for us? So I do actually remember Josh Fields. And you know what? Honestly, if he didn't hit that grand slam or if he didn't catch the last out of the Burley Perfect game, I might not remember him. Even as a diehard White Sox fan that I became in maybe 2000 or 2001. So he was actually drafted in the first round of the 2004 draft, 18th overall out of Oklahoma State University. And he was once thought to be a power-hitting corner infielder. I mean, which it made sense. He had the build. You know, he, he did have some power. He just He's kind of like Tyler Flowers. You know, he swung hard. He just didn't hit it very often. Um, and, True you know, that. Add him to the list of White Sox position player 
draftees in that era that just didn't work out. Brian Anderson, Joe Borchard, Jared Mitchell. Joe Borchard. That I love that. Wow. I haven't thought of that name That's in years. Name. That's a name. Problem. And what is Joe Borchard's claim to fame, if I may ask? His name rhymes with Orchard, and it's fall. I, okay, I, it's, it's, it's it apple fall season. season. Okay. Like, Tuck's not wrong. I was going to say he actually hit the um, the longest home run ever recorded at the White Side, the new Comiskey Park, 504 feet in 2004 against the Philadelphia Phillies. Now, where does that land? Was it all right? So, is that left field, right field? That's actually the right right center concourse. It got way up there. So, on the concourse, or did he like hit the wall beyond the concourse? I think it landed on, on like the. Like on, on the, on the ground of the I'm trying, to, I'm trying to envision how far away 504 feet is. That's a tank. Yeah, he, he hit it well. Um, you know, unfortunately, the rest of his hits combined, and the majors didn't total that. <laughs> but you know what? He'll be remembered for that forever, so credit to him. Shout out to Joe Borchard. Yes, yeah, Joe Borchard. Good for him. Rolling in to the third inning, um, Burley toes, uh, toes the rubber against Kapler, which is a name that will pop up, Hernandez, and Jason Bartlett. Now, Jason Bartlett, from the commentator's point of view, was on an offensive tear. Today, not so much. So Kapler goes ahead and flies to left. Actually, a little fun fact about that fly to left. Off the bat, when you watch the game again, it looks like that's a gapper. Cap- Kapler had a, a good dig. Yeah, it, mm-hmm. it looked it looked like it was a gapper, and Carlos Quinton, of all people, got over there, and he made the catch on the run. And it's just a backspin. What, what was his nick? Did he have a nickname? Carlos Quinton? Carlos Quinton? Yeah. This is Q? I know he Oh, had, um, I'm thinking of uh, Carlos Lee. El Caballo. Yeah. 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 I don't think Quinton had a nickname. I, I'm not a big fan of Carlos Lee. A lot of, a lot of bad Cubs on Reese. Pick. Uh, on, on the Sox and the Astros for him just destroying the Cubs. Jeremy. The Brewers too, right? Pick a yeah. Carlos, Quinton or Lee. That's a tough one. You know what? I'm going to go with... Carlos Lee, because Car- if it wasn't for Carlos Lee, there would have been no Scott Pitsednik because the White Sox traded for Carlos mm-hmm. Lee for Scott Pitsednik shortly before the 2005 season. Yes. Huh. I like that. Good point. Uh, Kapler flies out to left. Good drive. Hernandez, first pitch strike. Um, Alexei Ramirez tosses him out at first, and then Bartlett rounds out the third inning with a fly out to left field. Looking at the White Sox portion of the third inning, fly out to right for Jermaine Dye. And two flyouts to center for Canerco and Quinton. That wraps up the first third of the game. Mikey, take us through innings four, five, and six. All right, so uh, Burley comes out to uh, start the top of the fourth and immediately starts to uh, get a little friction going. Um, He ends up uh, going full count on Melvin Upton, formerly B.J. Upton Jr., I believe. If I'm not mistaken, that might um, be a thing. I think you might have the juniors and the Melvins and the BJs all There's mixed, a lot mixed of up Uptons yeah. these days. But uh, he goes full count on Upton and uh, ends up striking him out on a full count changeup, blown away. Pretty ballsy call there, but uh, I like it. I'm going to confirm BJ on that one. It, it is, is BJ yeah, confirmed. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I don't feel. Me- I don't think Melvin and BJ are two are different people. They're I, not the same. You know what, I, I think no, I, one of the Uptons went back to a previous name. After oh, because there's Justin. Yeah. yeah. Hello. I think it was it was BJ and then Melvin and then BJ again. Is that it? A lot I of Uptons, huh? Melvin, then BJ, then Melvin again. At the time, he was BJ. Oh. Right. No, at the time of this game, he was Melvin. No, no, that's false. I can confirm false. That's I watched false the entire there, broadcast. Huh? Yes. Well, then he's back to Melvin now. That's where I'm. I, I'm confused. Okay. I really care. I'm. I'm very concerned about the status of the Uptons. Well, if, regardless. If of, your name's not Kate, I'm not in. It's like the old name that Molina they used to play on Sports Center. But re- regardless of which Upton it was, it was a full count that Burley had to start the top of the fourth with. Ends up throwing a changeup, strikes him out. Really good call there. Carl Crawford flies out to left field, and um, Evan Longoria hits a line out to the shortstop Alexei, and it wasn't really well struck, but it was hard enough that if it was a few steps to the left or the right, Alexei might not get there, but it was hit right to him. Um, then going to the bottom of the bottom of the fourth, uh, the Sox didn't do a whole lot. Uh, Beckham uh, and Jason Nix both fly out. Ramon Castro ends up walking, and Josh Fields hits a fly ball to center field to fly out. Um then you go back to the top of the fifth, and Burley comes back out. You got Carlos Pena, who grounds out to first base. And I really liked watching this play because it made me think of something that Burley did so well, which was field his position. And uh, just a, just seen by how how quickly he got from the pitcher's mound to first base, just to field a simple grounder that the first baseman had to go to the right on, it was just still just very impressive. Dialed in. Yeah, he's a multiple uh, gold glove winner. Yeah. Dialed yeah. in. And, and and something small and simple like that, it's just something that I really still appreciated. Um, but then Ben Zobrist, uh, he ends up hit, grounding out to shortstop in the hole, and 
Alexei actually makes a pretty slick backhanded play running into the hole. It wasn't a web gem, but it was not a, a can of corn. Mm-hmm. Um, then after that, uh, Pat Burrell ends up Kane. Uh, yeah, Pat Burrell strikes out swinging uh, to end of the top of the fifth. We go to the bottom of the fifth, and this is where the uh, Sox would just add a nice little insurance run, just in case. Uh, Scotty Pod, Scott Pitsednik, he leads off with a double to right, and then Alexi uh, follows him up with a double to right field uh, to drive in Pitsednik. Uh, that pretty much does it from there. Jermaine Dye strikes out. Canerico flies out deep to center. Uh, and then Carlos Quinton grounds out to uh, second base. And after this point, uh, we're, we can be done talking about the White Sox. Yeah, because there's, no the the there's no more hits. There's no more hits. They got their five runs. They said, let's get Burley this perfecto. We're going to be in, out, on um, with life. Yeah, so then uh, coming to the top of the six, Gabe Kapler comes up. And he grounds, the, he grounds out the third base. And then, I don't, I don't know if this is Michael Hernandez or Michelle Hernandez. It's not Kike. We can confirm that. Okay. He's on or the Dodgers. Felix Kike. or Levan. Right. So we, we from our Levan, list of like from Good our boy. list of suspects, we have narrowed it down significantly. Do you, do you have that? Is it Michael or Michelle? Yes. Okay. That might be all the Hernandez's out there. I think we touched mm-hmm. on them all. So yeah. M. Hernandez then also grounds out to third base. Um cute little note about this is that uh, both of uh, Kapler and Hernandez's ground outs to third base, rookie Gordon Beckham made a couple pretty good plays. Like, again, somewhat routine, but he made them look really easy and he showed what he was really best known for, which was a good glove. Then uh, then this is where Burley starts to get a little get a little rough around the edges here. It's uh, top of the sixth, two outs, and he goes down 3-0 to Jason Bartlett. And then uh, he battles back to force a full count and gets him to ground out to shortstop. And uh, then, of course, the Sox didn't do a whole lot in the bottom of the sixth. Watching the game, knowing that I'm watching Mark Burley's perfect game, so many moments like that, it's 3-0. And in my head, I'm th- is he gonna, does he actually walk him? Do, am, I, am I messing up? But so, so, many, so many times, Burley to- toes the line, complete ice in his veins, gets the job done. So we're going to head to the seventh inning. Jeremy's going to take us through innings seven, eight, and nine. So one more time through the batting order. When the fans start to get really excited for the perfect game or the no-hitter. So now, is it just me? or Because I feel like I get excited for no-hitter after the first out of the game is recorded. That was my entire college career. <laughs> if, if I got the first out of the game, let's go. Quickly, the ERA decided to rear its ugly head again. But just like Mark Burley, that, that is one thing that he and I had in common. We we could remember and, and understand when we had a no hitter going very early in the contest. You got you to get the first guy to have a perfect game. So. Yeah, and and I I did that some, sometimes. I did that a few times. You get the first, first guy. Out. Yeah, no, not, not no, the perfect game. No, uh, no hitter. Took a no hitter into the uh, in the to the eighth inning in my college career. Only walked seven guys during the outing. So. <laughs> Uh, I was close to Burley status. I knew exactly how he felt. Um, it was uh, the Burley scene. Didn't walk people. Yeah, I did. Um, in in college, I remember the scene. The stands packed with empty seats. You can you can hear a pin drop in the stadium, not because of the tension, because no one was there. But uh, Mark Burley and I, a lot of similarities. So in in the seventh inning, there was really no sense of alarm for Burley. Got harmless grounders by. Upton and Kyle Crawford, and then a lazy flyout by Evan Longoria. In the eighth, uh, Burley started the inning by painting the outside corner with an 0-2 fastball to get Carlos Pena looking. Next batter was Ben Zobrist, who actually worked his way to a full count, another full count, uh, but Burley got Zobrist to foul out to Gordon Beckham. Fun, fun tidbit about Ben Zobrist. A, looks like a child in 2009. His face looks like a thumb to me. No idea why. No <laughs> waggle. No bat waggle from Ben Zobrist in 2009. Oh, he's, he's had that with the Cubs, though. Yeah, the obsessive, like, yeah. hitchy he actually cut down on that bat shape, waggle. Well, he should have brought that back for this game because it uh, didn't go well for him. <laughs> and and so, um, so he fouled out to Beckham there as the second out of the inning after a full count. And then Pat Burrell was the final hitter of the inning. And after he just missed hitting a double down the line on a ball that was fouled by inches... He ended up hitting a soft liner to Beckham at third base to end the inning. The ball wasn't crushed, but, you know, certainly could have been a base hit if it was hit, you know, a couple steps to the right or the left of Beckham. And then as we head into the ninth, there was, drumroll, the switch. 
Dun, dun. The switch was Dwayne Wise entering the game for left fielder Carlos, Carlos Quinton. Uh, center fielder Scott Pesednik moved to left, and Dwayne Wise took center field. In the, in the game, that, that was a cliff note as we head into the ninth. I, and had they known what it was going to be, they very casually mentioned his name, and I, I think they had no idea what was about to happen. No, definitely not. I mean, Scott Pesednik was a, a fast center fielder as it was. The move was clearly to replace Quinton and left, but you know, I don't even think Pesednik gets, gets to that ball. Do up in the ninth was Gabe Kapler, Hernandez, and then Jason Bartlett. First of all, let's just say that this is the perfect assortment of nobodies that are known to break up a no-hitter or a perfect game. <laughs> and I actually have I actually have zero statistical evidence to back me up on this. I like it. But doesn't it always seem like the team's best hitters are the never never the ones to break it up? Yeah, we'll we'll roll with it. That's good. It's always <laughs> well, something. Well that's just my opinion. But sure enough, Gabe Kapler, who never who never stayed with one team for more than two weeks at a time, it seemed like, he did everything he could to stop the Burley Burley from achieving history. If you're listening to a podcast about Major League Baseball, I'm sure you've heard of the catch by now. And you know the ball will sit well into the left center gap and Right away when it was hit, the stadium went quiet because what were the odds that that was going to be a hit? Probably 95% or higher. And Dwayne Wise went back there. He jumped up, made the play. It caught it temporarily. And then it seemed like the ball was going to pop out. He actually opened up his mid. The ball came out, and then he caught it with his bare hand. When you watch it, when when I was re-watching this, and and you see uh, the, the replay in slow-mo... It looks almost as if he looks into his glove as he bounces off the wall, not thinking that he even had it in there. Yeah, I think that's why he opened his glove. And it's like he opens his glove and he looks and it almost in slow motion. It looks like he rolls it out of his glove intentionally, like. But I think it was just he didn't he didn't think it was in there, and he, I think he was surprised and made the quick reaction to to barehand it. It just looked like a really odd, like flashy transfer, even though it was just completely. Happenstantial, like so, it was wild. I'm pretty sure that 2009 was was pre was the pre replay era, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So, oh yeah, oh yeah, well so, before. So here's the question I have: he, he seemed to catch it in his mitt, and then he opened his mitt and caught it with his bare hand. If he opens his mitt and doesn't catch it with his bare hand, does he get credit for the out? Well, no. it, it would it, it would be a completion of catch thing where if he hits the ground and the ball comes out, that's not a catch. They, and, they and would the not. The ball call. was out before the the ball was out before he hit the ground. Because he, by the time he hit the mm-hmm. ground, he already had it corralled in his left Caught hand. Caught it back again, yep. So, yeah, if, if that ball comes out and he does not catch it, that would easily be ruled as a non-catch, probably live, too. Not even with a replay. Um, so, yeah, pretty wild that that happened. And obviously, that is what I alluded to earlier and where I was when this happened. I turned my TV on as that ball gets hit in the air. I didn't see the ball get hit, but I saw Dwayne Wise as the screen started to light up hit the wall and make the catch and hear Hawk go wild. So At least you're lucky enough to catch that one live. You know, that's actually one of the biggest regrets I have in my time spent as a Sox fan is I didn't get to see that one live. I don't think I'll ever be as happy for a single sports moment as I was when I saw Paul Canerco catch the last out of the 05 World Series, but I feel like this one would have been a really close second, and, you know, I only got to see it on replay, so yeah, sucks for me. Next batter of the inning was, was the catcher again, Michelle Hernandez. Who legs over sitting before worked Burley to a full count? Burley actually went with the changeup on the three-two and had Hernandez way out in front for a swinging whiff. And then the final batter of the game was none other than Jason Bartlett, and I'm sure you have all seen this out as well. Harmless grounded to Alexei to seal the deal. But you know what? The the easy grounder, the routine play for the last out of the perfect game. What do you think is going through Alexei's mind right there? Actually, he was quoted later saying that he uh, had a bum ankle. And uh, he just told himself they had to deal with the pain and really get down on that one. And he said he wanted the ball to come to him, but he won it in the air. And it was on the ground. He said he just had to deal with the pain. I'm actually even more nervous as if I'm Josh Fields at first base than I'm Alexia. I'm thinking, like, okay, the, the ball is being thrown to me. It's a perfect throw. If I miss it, then then we really got some problems. Right. But uh, we, there's someone better who can tell us exactly what happened. Let's take a listen. Full disclosure, I have no idea how that's going to sound live, but I was riding the lightning, 
Uh, so we're just going to play it through. We're not going to edit it out. If you just heard uh, a sound, it, it sounded like someone was being stabbed in the back, but they were saying yes instead of no. Th- that is what it sounded like to me. That was a total 100% Hawk call. And for someone who is not a Hawk fan in the slightest bit, I appreciate and really enjoy that call. I really do. It, it was a, uh, he had a couple really good call. I mean, I know that, Hawks always had the one-liners, but he had a couple calls in this game that always stick out to me. The, the when Wise makes the catch, the in my 50 years, given the circumstance, it's the greatest catch I've ever seen. The Alexei, and then a whole bunch of yeah, guys. yeah. <laughs> but I think my favorite is as uh, as the Sox walk off the field after the top of the eighth, and he says, you know, call your sons, call your daughters, call your friends, call your neighbors. And then, you know, Burley's got a perfect game going into the ninth. In, and in 2018, that probably sounds like send, send a text message to the people you know. Put it on Twitter. Yeah, send a Snapchat. Out, but it, grab a telephone. Wind up the dial. <laughs> hit them up. Make a phone call. Find, yeah. Tell them to find a television set because we're in the middle of history. Well, that does it. For the rundown, but that does not do it. We're at the 30-minute mark. Um, we're we're going to run a little bit long today. We aim to have these pods in and out, not pod, Scott Pitsednik, but the, yeah, the podcast. The po- just pun, for clarity. Pun, pun, pun intended or no pun intended? Uh, yes. Pun achieved. Pun achieved. Okay. okay. Regardless, yes. Um, but we're going to run a little extra. we got a lot of little tidbits, and, and that that's what we think... Uh, makes this podcast special. That we're we're looking at, at the game from a little bit ten years down the road, nine years down the road. But before we get into that, I got to give the mic over to Mikey to tell us about the great guys at Overtime Sports Network. Go ahead, Mikey. All right. So uh, the Wheelhouse Baseball Podcast is proud to be a part of Overtime Sports Network. The Overtime Sports Network is a network of podcasts and bloggers coming together to cover every corner of the sports world with six podcasts. And 15 bloggers. Be sure to find something to like over to o- otsportsnetwork.com. Once again, that is otsportsnetwork.com. Just, I mean, I'm wearing my uh, OTSN t shirt right now. They are available for purchase. Um, prices and all that jazz can be found on their Twitter page. That's at underscore OTSN. Love the guys at Overtime Sports Network. Again, I, in my eyes, I'm the Hawk Harrelson of this broadcast in regards to Overtime Sports Network. I, gentlemen, I have huge news. I have just been named, and by just, I mean like 12 hours ago, been named. The vice president of Overtime Sports Network. I'm, uh, let's clap it up. Yeah, let's clap it up. Yep. That's yeah, all right. Talk peace. Thank you for making me lead the round of applause. It's a big but day for you. It, it is. And then the first wheelhouse first podcast. First podcast. The Red Sox are playing the Yankees right now. The phone is off. I have committed myself to off phone. Um, there's a lot of emotion going on. We're really excited. But again, a lot of this stems from Overtime Sports Network, Kyle Gagliardi, T Walk. There's so many podcasts Funk Masters of Wrestling, AWI Pods, Section 247, Coffee with Friends. Coffee with Friends. It's not, it is not a coffee review podcast. Um, that's, it, what I, that's what I thought was coming. That's what, and it would be that would be a perfect corner of the Overtime Sports Network, a coffee review podcast. It's a, it's um, it's a gentleman by the name of Carl Coffee. Does a great job. Uh, funny, a splash of sports, a splash of comedy, a dash of humor, and some hilarious Craigslist prank calls. So, big wiffle ball guy. Oh, he, the, the biggest. The, one of the biggest. One of the biggest. One of. And also, yeah, you completely forgot. Uh, at T Walk GBL, um, which is Griffle Ball podcast again. Also Griffle part Talk. Of the, also part of the OTSN network. So make sure make sure you hop on at underscore OTSN. Again, if you're not on Twitter and you're not following us, I'm not sure how we can be friends. Make sure you get on Twitter at Wheelhouse Pod, on Facebook at Wheelhouse Pod. If you've enjoyed the podcast to this point and feel like tuning out, go ahead. But don't forget to share this and let people know that we're out there. But we are not done. We, we've got a little bit of wrap-up to do. Uh, we're going to look at the game now. Nine years later, look back at some of the stats, some of the quirkies, and go from there. So the first thing, Burley, 19 out of 27 first pitch strikes. That's 70%. Mikey, is that good? That is um, doing it pretty well, I would say. Confirmed pretty Um, well. And it makes sense. He was someone who always pounded the zone. Actually, uh, coming into the game, he had a uh, 261 batting average against. Um, for the season on his 19 starts, 
uh, with almost identical splits, 262 against lefties and 261 against righties. Um, but that comes from a guy who just pounds his own. He trusts his defense. He gets out of he gets out of the game with 115 to 120 pitches somewhere in there. I'm trying to read 116. my hand. 116. 116. So right on the money. Way to go, Jim. Nailed it. You weren't wrong. Unlike any of the race hitters on uh, on this day in July, gets through f- manages to navigate through five full counts. He had eight at bats, go six plus pitches. So. Um, you when you couple that with two of the foul smashes, the Burl banger in the gap early in the game, the Kapler catch, to me that is baseball in its purest sense. That you it, it, when we when we look back, Przinsky, AJ Przinsky went on later. He, he gave an interview about that day because Przinsky did not catch this game. He did not catch this game. Ramon Castro, caught, Ram- I believe. Uh, uh, yes. uh, 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 a name that you will, you how could you forget? Ramon Castro. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Good old, good old Ramoni. Right, know, and you would have called it. Now, Przinsky looks back and, and, and when he's telling the story, he talks about Burley's day. Shows up late to the ballpark. He's a mess. Burley was a routine guy. You could see it on the mound. The game was two hours and three minutes. Cruising. So he's got it. He's got his routine. He, know, he knows what he wants to do. Doesn't have the energy drink. He's frazzled. Um, has the right attitude. Tells AJ. AJ says, "Well, go throw and just go throw a no hitter today." Real off the cuff. Burley says, "No, I've done that already. I'm going to go throw a perfect game," and he does. Now, it, true or false? Don't know. There, there. You know, urban myth. But it, when it's coming from AJ Przinsky himself, uh, very honest, straightforward guy, and AJ Przinsky, not known to tell a lie. I buy it, gentlemen. Buy it. Sell it. What do you think? I'm going to say buy it. But you know what? At the same time, I'm buying it. It's like I feel like a lot of times pitchers will just joke, "Hey, I'm gonna throw a perfect game," and it, and it doesn't happen. What? Uh, how, how many times doesn't happen? So I'm, that, I'm still waiting on it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, just because the one time you joke about it and it does happen doesn't doesn't mean that it was some special <laughs> magic. You're happened. buying it at a discount. It sounds yeah, like I'll, I'll buy it, but I'm not gonna pay full price. True. Not today. No, no. So true story. We're gonna go uh, mid to late 2000s in the same era. Uh, uh, the Chicago Bears had a very uh, prolific kick returner. Da Bears. Uh, Devin Hester. And every single kickoff and punt return, I would sit there with my buddies and I would say, hey, can I call one here? Can I call it here? Oh, he's returning it. I'm calling it here. And, I mean, he did it often, but he also did more often than anyone else in history. And it made me look like a genius. My, you know... A 9% success rate. So I buy that Burley said it, but I also buy that he said that a lot. Buying it at a discount. Buying it at a, at a discount. Yeah, confirmed. I, I stack three coupons. I'll take it. I'm not paying full price. If that was the only time Burley ever said that in his career, good for him. Doubt it. All right, gentlemen. Um, l- uh, trivia question during the broadcast. Okay, so watching the broadcast, the White Sox do their Aflac question. They've got the duck, you know, muddle across the screen. Aflac. Trivia question on this day, and this is in 2009, so you got to take it back. As of July 23rd, 2009, the question was Who are the three Rays that have had 100 plus RBIs in consecutive seasons? Three of them. All right, so we're going to be a team here. Quickly, okay. yes. I got, I, I got a couple of guesses. I'll go Evan Longoria. Okay, that's a fair guess. You got to give me your three, and I'll tell you how many you're right. All right, uh, and I'll then I'll let you go Evan again. Longoria, Fred McGriff, and, and a really, really old Wade Boggs. You are correct about one of them. Crime dog Fred McGriff, ninety nine, two thousand, two left. Two left. All right. Um, Current no, no cur- Longo on on this no hit roster. It is not Evan Longoria on this no hit roster, and a guy you haven't th- heard. You've heard of him. You haven't thought of in years. Can I use a lifeline? Yeah. Did the guy play in the game? One of them played in the game. Okay, I'm gonna say. And how- at this point, one of the uh, your Carlos Pena. You got it. He was leading the AL in home runs. Hot topic. Um, 2007, 2008. Now, who is the last one? And the, they didn't play in this game. 2003 and 2004. All right, I'm gonna say just because I really like the guy's name, Rocco Baldelli. Uh, Confirm no. I like. The, Did I he like have any draw. seasons at 100 RBIs? I don't know if he Couldn't had tell you, but I really want to say Rocco Baldelli on this podcast. Oh, yes, man. and I'm, and that's wheelhouse, baby. <laughs> when we talk about obscure players, uh, okay, you're not gonna. 2004. Let me actually let me get a serious guess here. Starts with an A. First name, last name. First name starts with an A. Last name starts with an H. Now you have it. Oh. You're welcome. Ooh. 
I'm trying to rack my brain for these awful early 2000s race teams. Yeah, those um, are some bad teams. Because um, we're, we're talking five or six. We got good years. hitters on a bad team, him. Oh, that's going to. Jeremy Ratterjack asked Chicago <laughs> State, good hitter on a bad team. I'll tell you that. Oh, uh, you're going to, when, whenever you do end up saying this out loud, because clearly neither it's of us. It's going to be soon. I feel like I'm, I'm going to know the, ga- I'm gonna I'm, know the I'm guy's gonna name. I'm going to know it. I'm going to be You, really you absolutely do know him. If you know Rocco Baldelli, you know <laughs> this guy. On that team. Not like I this love guy. The uniform, so that's yeah. why I remember that team. Oh, yeah. Uh, how much time do we have? Red hair. Red hair. Oh no. Oh, uh, a A. I I feel like red hair, reddish red hair. hair. Not like not like can, ginger can, red. Can I get an ethnicity? Uh, whoa, caucus, uh, whoa, whoa. Confirmed white. Confirmed white? I don't know if that's full half. I not no uh, neither. Yes. I don't know. I'm the, the only. Red ha- red hair baseball player that might have had 100 RBIs that's coming to mind is Bobby Keelty in that era. Uh, nope. We have, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, we have, it's not Matt Merton. <laughs> the initials were AH, so <laughs> Matt Merton is close, but but not that close. Same as Bobby Keelty. Um, 2003, 2004. Gentlemen, you have failed the trivia question because you did not guess Aubrey Huff. Oh, oh no. Aubrey oh, Huff. Huff. Hey. Yeah. Good player. Uh, really good had you. some time with the Giants, too, I believe. You know what? I'm actually going to say that Aubrey Huff did not have red hair. So, you know what? You had me walking down the wrong path. False. I said kind of red hair, and I did. I said he was confirmed not a ginger. Um, so, yeah, I'm actually, actually they're, they're, not, even, not even a bronze hair. I'm looking at him right now. Not even any bronze. Well, we wouldn't, want it, we wouldn't want it to be bronze. Might have dyed it red for the 2003 and 2004 season. No, so there's, yes, there's that, a red that, tint in it. That's I'm the only thing that makes any confident. sense that he did that thing. Well, speaking of sense, speak, making sense or not making sense, let's talk about the August 1st promo that the White Sox were pushing during this game, get out to the ballpark, August 1st, 2009. We are playing the New York Yankees. Come out to the ballpark. If you're one of the first 20,000 fans, which, uh, again, today, le- yearly average, then there's 8,000 people not getting this bobblehead. You're going to want to get this bobblehead. A Miller Lite beer vendor bobblehead. Unbelievable. You, you've never seen anything like it, right? No, and, and there, I think there's a reason because I don't, I, I don't feel like this is a good push. Now times are hot. If they did a beer vendor bobblehead in 2018, they would still have 19,000 of them. Yeah. I don't. But in, in, fun fact, my favorite part about this particular beer vendor bobblehead, they put the beer vendor in a White Sox uniform. Yeah. That's because you see that everywhere, right? I would like to see. I feel like I would uh, beers purchased per game from a beer vendor from me would go up if they're walking around in uniform. Full uniform. With the name yep. and their own number? Ev- yes. Cleats? Yes. Uh, uh, cleats uh, dangerous on those concrete Not sets? if you go with the rubber, and the rubber are better on your feet. You're right. You're not wrong. So you know, That makes them a lot more credible, too, going up and down you know, the, the stairs with cleats on. You know, I might want to buy beer from someone yeah, that's ris- risking his life to, to sell it. Yeah. So, uh, metal cleats are I'm not buying. No, but, and it would get annoying with the clack, clack, the metal cleat sound on concrete. Clack, get your beer here, clack, Especially clack, clack, no, clack, not clack. A lot of people at the ballpark. Clack, clack. And, yeah, and it would, it it would yeah. ring. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it would ring. So um, we got through the trivia question. Um, last little bit. I want to talk a little bit about Eric Cooper. Eric Cooper is the home plate umpire. When I'm watching the game, it was nice watching the game without the K-Zone. There is no K-Zone there. So you're just watching the pitch happen, and you're not letting the TV tell you how to feel about the pitch. You're watching it. It's nice. I, I, I'm i split on the K-Zone. We could save that for another episode. But Eric Cooper had a wide zone in the game, and he was known for favoring pitchers. He had one of the lowest walk rates among active umpires at that time. He's still, uh, Eric Cooper's still active. Um, and if you Google him, you're going to see that he is not afraid to get in a tussle. He likes to throw guys out if guys want to get heated. Um, Joe yeah. West-esque. Yes. And I respect it as a spectator. As a coach, when I'm coaching, when you make it about you, uh, it upsets me because then the show's not about me. And that's why, that's why we all coach. To you know, yes. to feel good about ourselves. So, yeah. um, uh, For those who can't do, he coach. had a he had a, a low walk rate, a high strikeout rate. He was the ninth highest strikeout rate amongst amongst active uh, umpires at that time. He's called multiple no hitters, two for Mark Burley. I will give you another trivia question. Big fan. In two thousand one, Eric Cooper called a no hitter for an Asian pitcher. Name him. Hideo Nomo. Hideo Nomo. I, Let's yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Let's I, go. I Love that. Hideo Nomo, one of the most often copied 
oh, yeah. um, deliveries oh, of yeah. all time, Atlanta. especially in wiffle ball. Oh, always. Severely inefficient. If I had a high schooler step on the mound and do it, I would let them. I would tell them it, it's not good. You're not going to get better doing that, but I like it. <laughs> I, the Some would say the innovator of quirky timing mess up mechanics a la Edson Volquez. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, with, with the uppity, uppity, kickity, whoopity. Uh. Leg kick. Is he really gonna say that that the Hideo Nomo was the innovator for that? I, he's got to get credit for something. There's got to be more. It's got to be more Louis Tion. He was the one who really had the little the waggle that Johnny Cueto likes to do. I've got his autograph. Side note. Oh, look at that. Just a little bit of side note. Well, uh, gentlemen, any last thoughts on the Mark Burley perfect game? We hope we hope we did it justice. We we covered what I felt. Uh, I dove pretty deep. I'm a Red Sox guy. So let we talk about a Red Sox game. A lot of this stuff's going to come off the top of my head. I'd had to do a little bit of work. Is there anything you guys want to mention to put a bow on on what what was a magical day? Not for Rat, not for Jeremy. Terrible day. Yeah, bad, bad day. Hey, bad day but Lincoln as Park. but as Lincoln Park would say, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> right? that was killer. Right. Thank that you. That was good. Um, no, actually, there was one little bow I'd like to wrap. On this press well, you don't wrap bows; you put them on. So, well, or you I, it tie them. On. I, I like I like to take the whole bow and tie it. Maybe he starts none from of, scratch. None of that sticky stuff. Like I'm not just sticking gotcha. the bow on. I'm doing the real thing. Uh, but uh, no, uh, in this in this game, it was in the middle of a three game consecutive part of Mark Burley setting a major league record at the time, which uh, just shows it just goes to show how locked in he was for this couple weeks. Um, his last out. In his start pr- prior to the perfect game, and then the first five and two thirds innings in the start after the perfect game, he retired forty five consecutive batters. Is that good? That seems good. Considered, uh, I would confirm good. Yeah, good. I would. I would confirm better than bad. I mean, you're, you're not gonna. Retire 100 in a row, but that'd be 45, crazy. 45 solid. Um, it's not the record anymore. It has since time, been broken. At the time, that was the record. He passed a Jim Barr, who said it in 1971. Where, where is the Jim Barr? Jim Barr. Oh, that, now, that's a gym I could get into. Whoa, wait, wait, now, time out. <laughs> not yeah. known for working out. The the Jim Barr <laughs> is is where I'd like to head. No, well, that's, that's the bar. Burn the calories the off, put them right back on. Let's go. Jim, which is like for barbells. Out. Uh, yeah, I'm, Can, I'm all, also a thousand also percent. Um, but also, Bobby Jenks, his teammate in 2007, across 14 relief appearances, also retired 41 in a row. But uh, yeah, Mark Burley uh, blew him all away with 45 consecutive batters retired. Bobby Jenks also would be a patron at the gym bar, yeah, far more frequently that. than the bar gym. Yes, yes he, confirmed. He, he's someone I could see being a nose tackle. Yes, that's for sure. Yes. Okay. So before we go, um, we we want to let you know about Overtime Sports Network. We let let you know about them. OTSportsNetwork.com underscore OTSN on Twitter. Make sure you go head over and check those guys out and check out every podcast. I'm sure I missed a few. There's so many, but there's so much good content out there. And you also need to be sure to check us out, Wheelhouse Baseball, on the Arena Sports Network. Check out Arena Sports Net on Facebook and on ArenaSportsNet.com. This show, the one you're listening to right now, which is ironic that I'm reading an ad at the end of the podcast telling you to listen to it again as I'm going through it. This show will be broadcast on Arena Sportsnet. This episode and every episode we release till the end of time. Till the end of time. Justin Timberlake? Sure. JT. Okay. Good hair. Um, on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Eastern. So if you're on the Eastern in the Eastern time zone, that's 6 p.m. If you're not in the Eastern time zone, please plan accordingly. We're uh, this will be on Arena Sports Net, where every fan has a voice and every team has a fan. Just at wrapping things up, uh, we're going to send it to the outro here in a second. But if you don't mind, you the listener, if we've brought you value, if we've brightened up your day this 48 and a half, 49 minutes, if you've enjoyed the podcast and think that you have friends, well, not if you think you have friends. That's weird. I, don't, I, mean, I hope you think you have friends because we love you. But uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, head over to Twitter. At Wheelhouse Pod, head over to Facebook, facebook.com slash wheelhouse pod. Share the love, spread the wealth. We love what we're doing. We'd love for you to get into it uh, and share it with us. Gentlemen, any last thoughts? This is a 
message to the Chicago White Sox. I believe that the Mark Burley perfect game was the last significant event to happen at that stadium. So you know what? Hopefully we could uh, we could make some some new memories happen soon. That because that was nine years ago. I've been I've been waiting a long time. Yeah, for, you, for, you for got some like that. coming up. They're gonna be uh, good. Uh, it's uh, you not know, Kopech. Tell yeah. you that it's going to be a while nothing for him. Will, nothing will happen with him next That's year. Hurtful. Yeah, even as a diehard Cuts fan, though, this is a huge moment in my sporting fandom life. I mean, Chicago, it's local. I still think it's awesome. Um, I, I love seeing history, regardless of the team, even if it's against the Cubs. As awful as it sounds, I mean, great things in the sport are fun to witness and watch. And it was nice to not be at the zoo. Again, we're Wheelhouse Can't Baseball. You just finished episode one. We love you. We appreciate you. We're going to send it to the outro. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Wheelhouse Baseball Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Wheelhouse Pod for more news and updates. See you next time.